systems. Uh, this is, uh, sorry, let me start the recording on my side. Sir Zhao Changhong uh, from the IE department. Uh, so first, let me use some time to introduce some general information about this class. Uh, this is my email. If you have any questions about the course, about materials, problems, exams, and so on, please feel free to send me email, make appointment. Uh, we have two teaching assistants for this class, uh, Ms. Yang Zheyuan and Mr. Xu Ke. Uh, uh, I see uh, Xu Ke is here. So perhaps uh, could you share your video and say hello to everyone, Ke? Um, hello, everyone. I am Xu Ke, the TA of the, the class. Nice to see you. OK, thanks, Ke. Uh, during the term, the two TAs will give tutorials, will make and grade your homeworks and answer all your questions uh, during their office hours. Uh, our class meet on Wednesdays uh, at this time, 11.30 to 1.15 uh, online via Zoom. On Friday, we have a 15-minute lecture starting at uh, 9.30, so it's early lecture. And the, uh, after the lecture on Friday, we will have a tutorial uh, provided by the TA uh, for 45 minutes. Uh, the tutorial will start from uh, week two. Uh, we already shared the Zoom link and access code on Blackboard for the lectures. And later, the TAs will share the tutorial, uh, the Zoom link for tutorial as well. Uh, both myself and uh, the TAs hold, hold office hours every week. Uh, my office hour is Thursday, 10 to 11 a.m. Or if you have any questions, and at this time is not a good time for you, please feel free to uh, send an email appointment and uh, uh, at any time. Uh, I can host office hours both online or in my office in uh, SHB 806. Uh, each of the TAs will host office hour, uh, host 1.5 1, 1. office hour uh, every week. Uh, Yang Zheyuan on Wednesday, Xu Ke on Friday. And both office hour sections will be online. Please see Blackboard announcements for the Zoom access to the uh, office hours. So for this class, uh, we will have a textbook, uh, so it's this one, uh, by Oppenheim and Wilski, uh, Signal Systems, uh, second edition. Uh, I, I got this one from the uh, uh, CHK uh, bookstore. Uh, there is uh, a Hong Kong version that's uh, much cheaper than the original version that's in the US. But uh, well, the textbook is mainly for your extended reading. And you can also find uh, useful exercise problems to deepen your knowledge and uh, practice your skills in solving practical problems related to signal systems. Uh, but the most important materials for this course, I would say, are the uh, slides and class notes, uh, which will be available on the Blackboard under the course contents there are also a very useful uh, open course from MIT, which I provide a link here. It's considered an extended version of this course because we only have 13 weeks. It's not possible to cover all the, the full set of knowledge about signal systems. But this MIT course uh, it has more uh, contents. So if you are interested in learning more, about this uh, subject, uh, you can refer to this course. They have good lecture notes, videos, and uh, practice problems. Also, this course has a lot of uh, mathematical contents. Uh, perhaps uh, if you have problems with uh, some uh, mathematical uh, terms, terminology, uh, you may want to search them online. Uh, what I find most useful are these two websites, Wikipedia and Wolfram MathWorld. 
so they provide the most precise and the most concise uh, explanations for math concepts. They also have examples how to uh, use these concepts to solve problems. The grading system for this class, we will have uh, uh, homework assignments, we have in-class tests, we will have a final exam in December. Homework assignments uh, come for 30%, in-class tests 20%, the final exam 50%. In this term, we will have tentatively six homework assignments. Uh, it means each will account for about 5% of your total grade. For homework assignments, uh, what I would like to emphasize is, uh, is always try to solve the problems yourself first. Uh, only after that, uh, you can discuss with your fellow students, uh, see if did something right or did something wrong. But uh, even after discussion, you must, however, write up your own solution. That's because uh, COHK adopts a policy of zero tolerance on plagiarism. And uh, you are the most elite engineering students of Hong Kong. Uh, you are the ones who create the future. So it's important for you to hold to the academic uh, honesty and integrity. All the homework assignments are submitted and graded on Blackboard. So every time you complete your assignments, please scan your solutions as a single PDF and submit under the correct link on the on Blackboard. So I will, I will announce homeworks and uh, uh, post the links and the problem sets, uh, well, usually one or one or two weeks before the deadline. We accept late homework with some uh, policy. If your homework is submitted at zero to 24 hours after deadline, it's counted as late by one day, and then counted by, uh, as uh, late by two days and so on. Uh, each late homework will be graded with discount. If your homework is late by one or two days, it so even if you got the full grade, you will only have 80% of the points for this homework. Late by three to four days, 50% points. And more than five days late, you will not have any points for this homework. Tentatively, we will have two in-class tests this term. Uh, each test will take a 55-minute lecture. Uh, so most likely will be on the Friday lecture. I will announce the test one about one week before it, and I will decide case by case whether each test is open book or closed book. The final exam will be in December. Uh, currently, uh, because of the uh, pandemic, it's still possible that we host online exam, but uh, things may change, let's see. Tentatively, the final exam will be closed book, closed notes, uh, no online resources allowed, no calculator is needed, not allowed. But uh, if there are some necessary formulas, uh, tables, numbers, etc., that would be useful for uh, writing a solution, they will be provided on the exam papers. Uh, because it's for this class, it's not critical to memorize all those uh, formulas of numbers and so on. It's important to grasp the skills and use the skills to solve practical problems. So those are some uh, logistic issues for this class. Uh, I don't know if anyone have asked a question about it. Okay, no questions so far. If you have something that need clarification, always feel free to send me email. So this class, uh, Signal Systems, the main content is a set of powerful mathematical tools that you will learn 
we will use. And those tools are required to analyze uh, signals, systems, and the interactions between them. So why we need to learn these tools? Because they are fundamental in the subjects that you will study during your time in the IE department. They are fundamental for communications, networking, electric and electronics, artificial intelligence, which is a very popular topic today, uh, medical care, which is important, finance, which is, which is good job market in Hong Kong. So signal systems are very well uh, related to these fields and uh, mathematical tools to deal with signal systems are, are what you need to learn in the second year of your curriculum. And also those tools uh, are used to tackle challenges associated with complicated systems everywhere from engineering to uh, our daily life for finance and also they deal with a big volume of information data. So today we are in the era of uh, big data. So learning signal systems is also, uh, also meets the need for the uh, big data, for the time of big data. So this is a brief outline of the course. Uh, during the first three or four weeks, we will uh, I will provide an introduction to signal systems, uh, including an introduction to complex numbers, because you will find that uh, when dealing with the signals and systems, you, the, they are always presented in the way of complex numbers. Uh, however, since you are only at the second year of your, your uh, college study, uh, complex, you may, now have laid a solid foundation for complex numbers. So this is also a good opportunity for you to know and to use this mathematical tool. And then we will come to a most fundamental, but most important kind of the system, which is linear time invariant systems. Uh, in practice, a lot of the systems are more complicated. They may be time variant, they may be nonlinear, but a lot of the methods to analyze those systems still are still derived from the methods that are used to analyze the basic systems, the linear time invariant systems, LTIs. That's why it is important. And then we will use more than half of the term to learn several different transformations of the signals. So the purpose we need to learn transformation of signals is that if you are given a signal that's presented in its original form, it is hard to understand its structure uh, and its, or its meaning. But if we can present the signal in a different coordinate or in a different domain, the structure might be clearer. That's why we will learn different transformations, including Fourier series, Fourier transform. So for both Fourier series and Fourier transform, they, they can be applied to continuous time signals, they can be applied to discrete time signals. And the essentially they have the same uh, mathematical implication, but uh, the detailed form is quite different. That's why we need to learn them separately. There are also Laplace transform, which is an extension of Fourier transform, uh, an extension of continuous time Fourier transform, and the Z transform, which is an extension of uh, discrete time Fourier transform. So we will learn all these different transforms during uh, as we progress. Uh, here are the two pictures of the important figures for this class: Joseph Fourier. French mathematician and physicist, uh, Pierre Simon Laplace, a French scientist and scholar. Uh, the Fourier transform and Laplace transform are named after them. Uh, those transforms, so from their, the years that they live, those you can see that these transforms are proposed almost 200 years ago, but they are still very important today. So. That's what I think the 
most important contributions that the previous scholars have made to us. It's exciting and interesting to learn them. So this is a review of the basic information of the course. Now let's come to the technical part. We will start from uh, introduction to signals systems. Okay. So for the introduction, uh, you are recommended to read the textbook chapter one. In this chapter, we will learn what is a signal. We will learn some basic operations of signals. Call, we, we, I call it time domain transformation of signals. Some basic properties of signals, in particular, whether a signal is an even signal or an odd signal, or whether a signal is periodic. We will also get to know some fundamental signals like impulse like step signal. About system, we learn what is a system and basic properties of systems like linearity, uh, whether system is memoryless or not, whether system is time invariant or not. And this naturally connects to the next chapter, next chapter linear time invariant system. Okay. So let's first look at a signal. What is a signal? A signal, essentially it is a function of some independent variables. Here by independent variable, we can have um, different choices. The independent variable can be time, can be location, can be frequency. In other words, a signal can be a function of time. It can be a function of location. It can also be a function of frequency. Well, in terms of frequency, it might be a little bit confusing, but as we progress, as we go to the Fourier transform, Laplace transform, we learn the so-called frequency domain. You will see the connection between time and the frequency, and you have a clearer understanding of why a signal can be a function of a frequency. So in this term, we will focus on independent variables being time and frequency. It's not, signal is not a uh, any function. It's a function that necessarily conveys some information about an event, a phenomenon, etc. So here are some examples of signals. Sound is a kind of signal, or voice is a kind of signal. We know that sound is, we hear sound because of the uh, a vibration of the air, water, or some solid medium. So the Sound can change over time. Basically, it's because the intensity of this vibration changes over time. In other words, we can, mathematically we can model sound as a, we can model sound as a function of time. We can model the intensity of vibration as a function of time, and it conveys information. For example, when you hear my voice, hopefully you can learn some knowledge about uh, this subject signal systems. But when you hear the voice from your boyfriend or girlfriend, I think the most critical information you should obtain is oh, his or her mood at this time. So sound is a signal. Image is another kind of signal. Uh, usually a static image is a function of location, 2D location. I use this example. So every pixel on this image have a coordinate, X and Y. And then the brightness and the color of this pixel is a function of this 2D location represented by this X or Y coordinate. And the, of course the image also conveys information such as a story, the story of the last dinner, or some thoughts of the painter, the artist. Well, stock index is also a function of time changes over time, and we can plot this function over time. It conveys information about the market performance, it conveys information 
that informs you whether you should invest or withdraw or redeem from the stock market. The signals are very important. They are everywhere in our life. For example, we have all those image processing functions with Photoshop, with our smartphones, with our cameras. And so all these image processing tools are dealing with the signals as functions of 2D locations. Voice signals are processed also on all kinds of uh, technical platforms that we, uh, we touch every day uh, through the voice recognition. Uh, they use some natural language processing algorithms to process those signals. Uh, in security, identification, and uh, a surveillance, we have a face ID, a fingerprint, uh, video recognition. They also deal with signals. So instead of static images, they deal with dynamic images. And also uh, in finance, economics, for example, when we come to stock prediction, we are using the, a function over the past time to predict a function over future time. It's also a kind of uh, signal processing. So from, from all those importance of signals, we study the, uh, today we study some basics about them. So first, there are two kinds of signals, uh, continuous time signals, discrete time signals. I will uh, give their definitions and use some examples to illustrate both kinds. And then we come to basic operation called time domain transformation of signals. There are three categories of uh, transformations that we will learn and we will use most frequently during the term time shift time scaling, time reversal. Time reversal is called, also called time reflection. And we will learn basic properties like of signals, like whether it's an even signal or signal, uh, whether it's periodic signal. The definition of uh, uh, these signal properties and the transformations are very much similar between the continuous time and discrete time signals. And therefore, for convenience, we will mainly use the continuous time signals to illustrate those concepts. But the same concepts also apply to discrete time signals. So first look at what is a continuous time signal. By definition, signal is a function of independent variable. Let's focus our um, independent variable on the time t. So we use t to denote time. And without loss of generality, let's assume that t can take any real, uh, real number of any t in r. And x of t as a signal is a function of t. So we plot the way we plot function is just use t as the horizontal axis, x of t as the vertical axis, and the value of x t at every corresponding t, if we connect all those points, it's a continuous and a smooth curve. And this is called a continuous time signal. Basically, t can be every real number. And the convention to denote a continuous time signal is to use x, uh, a round brackets, a pair of round brackets, t inside. For example, x t equals t squared is continuous time signal and plot, we can plot them. So this plot that should be very familiar to you. And in particular from this plot, we can mark any data points that corresponds, uh, that connects a time t to the value of signal x of t at that time. For example, at time t equals minus one, we can read from this curve that x of t equals one, t equals zero, x of zero equals zero, and so on. But again, for continuous time signals, the time is not restricted to minus one, zero, one, two. They can be any real number, or rational, irrational number. For example, x of 0.5, you can get its value 
x of square root of two, you can have a corresponding value. And this is quite different from discrete time signal. Discrete time signal, the independent variable, we also call it time, but it is discrete time. They can, the time can only be integers. It can be negative integer, uh, positive integer, but they must be integers. Corresponding to every integer, there is a value x of n, but note that although n must be integer, x of n does not have to be integer. It can be any real number, or it can even be a uh, complex number. We will later learn complex number. And uh, we use different convention to denote discrete time signal uh, from the continuous time signal. The continuous time signal, we use the round brackets. For discrete time signal, we use the, uh, the, the square brackets. But this is an example of a discrete time signal x of n. So n as the work horizontal axis taking all the values of integers. And for every integer, for example, n equals minus four, x of n takes the value minus four. So x of minus four equals minus, sorry, equals minus one. Uh, similarly, x n equals minus three, we can read from the figure that x of minus three is minus one half. It doesn't have to be a integer. x of minus two, equals one half, so everything can be read from this figure. So x4, x5 are all zero. So this, these are the definitions of continuous time and discrete time signals. During this course, we will learn concepts, including uh, Fourier transforms, Laplace transforms, that Z transforms that are associated with this, both continuous time and discrete time signals. Well, Laplace transform for the continuous time signal, Z transform for discrete time signal. So it's important for you to understand the concepts of both kinds of signals to facilitate your future study. Uh, so next, let's look at some uh, operations of signals in the time domain. We call it the time domain transformations. The first kind of time domain transformation is the time shift. Uh, let's look at an example. The continuous time signal x of t equals t square, which is plotted by this black curve. Now, we shift this signal along the time axis to the right by two units. The signal we get is x of t minus two, which is t minus two square. How to make sure that this shift and this function, the correspondence is correct? Know that when we shift it, the shape of this curve does not change. So we only look at the change of one particular point, then we will know the change of the entire curve, the entire signal. Here, the most obvious point, the easiest point that we can look at is the lowest point of this signal or the central point of the signal. So it means when t equals zero, x of t is zero square, which is also zero. But after the shift, when t equals two, we look at this signal x, of t minus two, it becomes it becomes x two minus two because we replace t with two, which is two minus two square, zero square, which is zero. So it tells us that for this new signal x of t minus two, when t equals two, the value of the function is zero. So if we correspond, if we uh, map it back to the vertical axis, we see that the value it is zero. So it means this x from x of t to x of t minus two, it is a shift of two units to the right. So we are shifting it on the correct direction. And similarly, if we shift x of t equals t square by two units to the left, this point zero is 
this point t equals zero x t equals zero is moved to t equals minus two, and the va the value of this function is x of minus two plus two equals zero. We know that we are also doing the right thing. If we shift the signal x of t to x of t plus two, then we are shifting two units to the left. And from those two particular examples, we can obtain this general law. We have a continuous time signal, x of t, which can look arbitrary, that is continuous time. Then given an arbitrary number a larger than zero, if we change x of t to x of t minus a, then we are shifting it to the right along the time axis by a units. And if we change from x of t to x t plus a, then we are shifting the signal by a units along the time axis to the left. This is the time shift of a signal. Uh, so by the in the in this slide we look at the case a larger than zero. But what happens if we have a negative number a? What happens if we change from the signal x of t to x of t plus a for a negative number a? Is the signal shifted to the left or to the right? So uh, Actually, the answer for this question is that we are shifting it to the right. Because what well, we can understand in this way, we are changing from x of t to x t plus a, but a is a negative number, so we can write a, we can write plus a as minus the absolute value of a. And then this can correspond to the standard definition of a time shift signal. So by changing from x of t to x of t minus absolute value of a, we are shift this signal to the right by absolute value of a units. So the answer is that we are shifting it to the right if a is less than zero. But similarly, if we are shifting a signal x of t to x of t minus a for a less than zero, then we are actually shifting it to the left. This is about time shift. Then time scaling, another operation of the signal. We also illustrate this uh, operation using example. Again, we start from the signal x of t equals t square. And then if we change t to 2t, so we're changing from x of t to x of 2t, then we replace t with 2t, t we replace t square with 2t square, which is four times t square. And we plot this function is the red dash curve. Uh, we look at how a particular point on this signal change. Here, we first look at this point that is marked by this red circle, red empty circle. Yeah, at this point, t equals one, x of t is one square, which is also one. But after this scaling, of the, after the change of the signal, we have x of 2t for t equals 0. 0.5. So two times 0. 0.5 equals x of one, which is one square equals one. So which means for the new signal, x of 2t to take the same value, one, we must have t equals 0.5 instead of one. And this happens to every point that takes the same value as the original signal. So to take the same value, we must reduce the time t to one half of original value. Intuitively, we are compressing the signal x of t to a half. Note here that the compression is with respect to a fixed point t equals zero. Because if you look at this point, this point is on the original signal x of t 
it is also on the new signal x of 2t, it doesn't change. So it is called a fixed point of this compression. From x of t to x of 2t, we are compressing the signal to a half. Then what happens if we change from x of t to x of one half of t? So original signal x of t equal t square, the new signal plotted by this uh, blue dotted curve is x of one half of t. Again, we replace t square with one half of t square, which is one over four t square. This is plot. If you look at a particular point, this empty blue circle mark the point where t equals one, x of t equals one. And this solid blue circle marks a point that t equals two. When t equals two, we replace x of one over two t as x of one over two times two, which is x one, which is one square, which is one. In other words, for the new signal x of one over two t, to take the same value one as original signal, we must increase t from one to two. In other words, if this happens to every point of the original signal, then we are stretching the signal twice. And again, this stretch is with respect to a fixed point t equals zero. So this point is, is what pins the signal and does not change. But every other point, we expand it by two times, or we expand it twice, stretch it twice. This is what happens when we've changed from x of t to x of one half t. We can also generalize this kind of change from this particular example to, to a arbitrary number c. So we have a continuous time signal x of t. Sorry, here there should be a t with the uh, horizontal axis that is missing. When we change from x of t to x of ct, so we are scaling that signal. But the particular way that we are scaling it needs a further discussion. It depends on whether c is less than one or larger than one. If c is less than one, then we are stretching the signal. And we see that by stretching the signal, so th there is a valley and a peak for this signal here. By stretching this signal, the valley the fur, uh, moves further from the, uh, from the zero point. The peak is also move, moving further. When C is larger than one, we are compressing that signal. So by compression, it means the valley and the peak are both moving closer to the, to the point where T equals zero. But for either case, whether we are stretching the signal or compressing the signal, the fixed point is always t equals zero, which I marked with those black dots. So the, at the black dots, the signal does not change. So for t equals zero, x t is this value. Then for x c t, whether c less than one or larger than one, the point still takes the same value. That's why we call it fixed point. This is time scaling. And the third uh, operation, time domain transformation, is time reversal. It's also called time reflection or time mirror because of the nature of this transformation. Again, we have a continuous time signal, x of t. It looks like this. And we change it to x of minus t. So there is a minus sign in front of t. Then what does the new signal look like? It is just like we are mirroring this original signal with respect to the vertical axis t equals zero. So note that this vertical axis correspond to the time t equals zero. We treat it as mirror. Originally for this signal, we move along time t to the positive direction to the right we first have a valley and then a peak. But after the mirroring, we move to the left instead of right. We also first went through a valley and then a peak. So just like the signal is standing in front of the mirror and then change to x minus t. 
intuition is not very hard. And uh, here are some examples. So if we have the signal x of t equals t square, and we are mirroring it, then x minus t is the mirroring transformation or reflection transformation. Minus t square, the minus sign just disappear the t square. But what we found is that after the time reverse or the time reflection, the new signal x of minus t is the same as the original signal x of t because both of them are t square. And intuitively means they see the reflection of this signal over the vertical axis is just itself. We call this kind of signal an even signal. So the formal definition of the even signal is this signal x of t is an even signal if x of minus t equals x t. Let's look at another example. x of t equals t to the power of three t cubic. So it is plotted by this solid black curve. It takes negative value when t less than zero, positive value when t larger than zero. So what is the time reversal reflection of this signal? Again, to obtain time reversal reflection, we replace t with minus t. X of minus t is minus t square, um, cubic, which is minus t cubic. So from t cubic to minus t cubic, we flip it upside down to add a minus sign. Then it is like this blue dotted curve. Our observation is that x of minus t equals minus x of t. In other words, if we reflect this signal over the vertical axis, it is at the same time also the reflection of the signal over the horizontal axis. So this is the intuition of this, uh, this equation. For this kind of signal, we call it an odd signal. But formally, a signal x of t is an odd signal if x of minus t equals minus x of t. Okay, so to summarize, even signal x of t equals x of minus t, or the signal x of t equals minus x of minus t. But in general, even signal looks like this. It's a symmetric along the vertical axis t equals zero. Because of this symmetry, when we take the reflection, it's still itself. But for all signal, it is so-called anti-symmetric over the original point. And because when we reflect it over the vertical axis, must be the reflection over the, uh, must be a, a flip upside down. That's why it has this anti-symmetric structure. But one particular thing that we need to pay attention to the all signal is the original point where I marked with with a solid black dot. So this dot must be on the signal. Because x of t as a continuous time signal is a function of t, so on this plot, we can have the value of this function at every time t. But at the point t equals zero, the value of the function x of zero must be zero. Why? Because from the definition of the odd signal, x of t equals minus x of minus t, then we replace t with zero, x of zero equals minus x of minus zero. Minus zero is zero, so it's minus x zero. We move the minus x zero to the left-hand side, we get two times x zero equals zero. In other words, x of zero equals zero. So to conclude, for an odd signal, the origin, origin t equals zero, x of zero equals zero, must lie on that signal. Well, uh, one more example of even signal is x of t equals t absolute value, because if you plot absolute value of t, when t larger than zero, it's just t itself. When t less than zero, it's, it's minus t. But the 
absolute value of t must be non-negative, the y takes this shape that is symmetric over the uh, vertical axis, so it's an inner signal. But x t equals t, which is just a straight line with slope one, it's an all signal because it has this anti-symmetric structure. It, in particular, passes the origin zero, zero. And if you look at the two particular points on this signal, so x of one equals one, x minus one equals minus one, which all correspond to the definition of all signal. So let's have a 15 minutes break here. And uh, for the next part of this lecture, we will go through some examples to deepen our understandings of those time domain signal transformations. See you in 15 minutes. Recording. Let's now come back to the exercise for continuous time signal time domain transformation. We have this continuous time signal. Let's look at its different transformations. The first one is just using the definition of reflection. So make it like a mirror, uh, mirroring along the vertical axis. So the square, which was originally on the right, we move it to the left. This triangle, we move it to the right. Note that those uh, uh, critical coordinates if later when you are doing your uh, exercise or homework problems, it's also required that you mark those critical points uh, to, make, to make sure that you are doing the correct transformation. For example, well, this square is originally starting from one, ending at two, then after the mirroring it starts at minus two, ending at minus one, and similarly for the triangle. So that's the reflection from x of t to x of minus t. From x of t to x of t minus one, applying the standard definition is just a shift to the right by one. So the triangle is uh, originally starting uh, range, range across minus one to zero. And then after shifting it, it's now from zero to one and the square from one to two after we shift it to the right, it starts at two and at three. From x of t to x of t over two, applying the standard definition, stretching the signal twice. So here by stretching it, it means the following. Uh, originally this triangle is from minus one to zero. Again, I emphasized uh, many times that zero is a fixed point, so that zero point should not change. What is changing is everywhere uh, we stretch it twice. So minus one half is the peak. Now the new peak is at minus one. The triangle is, uh, if we look to the left, it finishes at minus one, now it finishes at minus two. But if we look at the horizontal, the, the vertical value of this peak, so originally the peak is at x of t equals one, after the stretch, it's still at x of t equals one. So I forgot to mark it, but this should be one. And it means that on the vertical direction, the value of the function does not change. What is changing is only along the time axis in the horizontal direction. And the same thing applies to the square on the right hand side. So one to two, now after the stretch, it becomes two to four. X of 2t, in the contrast, it's compressing the signal to one half. So the triangle from minus one to zero, we compress it, it starts at minus one half to zero. From one to two, the square, we compress it from uh, one half to one. Again, the compression only occurs in the, vert, uh, in the horizontal direction along time t. But if you look at the values of the vertical direction, it does not change. So the peak of the triangle is one, it's still one. The top of the square is two, it's still two. So along the vertical axis, the value does not change. Okay, the next transformation is to start from x of t, obtain x of one minus t. 
this is a little bit complicated. To complete this kind of a transformation, we actually need multiple steps. In this example, we need two steps. The first step, well, there are different methods or different routes that leads to the final result. So here, let's choose one of those methods. The first step is to do a reflection, x of t to x minus t, which we did before this result. And the second step is to shift the signal. And here I say shift it to the right by one because of following. So we have this continuous time signal x of minus t. By the standard definition of shift to the right, we should change t to t minus one. Again, let me emphasize that we are changing the variable t itself to t minus one. That's why we need these small brackets around t minus one. The negative sign in x minus t should just be copied down in the location where it was. Again, only changing t to t minus one. And then minus t minus one is one minus t. So this is the shift of this signal by one unit to the right. We can see the shift, right? From minus two to minus one, now is from minus one to zero. And the triangle from zero to one, the new triangle is from one to two, shift it to the right. We get x, one, x of one minus t. Well, there's, this is not the only way to perform this transformation. There is an alternative route to get the same result. We start from x of t, and this time we first shift it, but we shift it to the left by one unit. Applying the standard definition, shifting to the left by one unit, we obtain x of t plus one. And then we do the reflection on x of t plus one. The standard definition of reflection tells us that we change t to minus t. That's why when we do the reflection here, we are only changing t to minus t. So this is plus one, we still copy it here. We should not change the sign in front of one. We only change the sign in front of t itself. And x of minus t plus one equals x of one minus t. So we should have the same result. I didn't plot it here, but you can uh, plot it by your own and validate the result. By the way, uh, for this kind of uh, transformation that is composed of two or more steps, it's always useful to validate your result by doing it in different ways. Uh, the next one, we want to transform from x of t to x of 2t minus 1. So x of 2t minus 1. How, sh how we shall do that is we first shift it to the right by one unit. So from x of t to x of t minus 1, it's just a shift to the right by one unit. And then we compress this signal, x of t minus one, to one half. The standard definition of compression tells us that if we want to compress by one half, then we change t to two t. Again, I want to emphasize we are only changing t to two t, but the minus one is just a copy down without any change. And this is compression because originally this triangle uh, ranges across zero to one. Now it ranges across zero to one half. Originally this square is from two to three, and now it is, well, because it compression to one half, two divided by two is one, three divided by two is three divided by two. So this is the new range of the, of the square. The vertical values does not change. We are compressing it to one half. And similar to the last problem, we have an alternative method to complete this transformation. We, this time we can first compress x of t by one half. By the standard definition, we get x of two t. And then we shift it. But this time, note that we are not shifting it by one unit, but we are shifting it by one half unit. Why? Because by shifting it, we are changing t to two mi t minus one half. So this is 2t. We copy down the 2 without change. 
we are only changing t by t minus uh, to t minus one half. That's why we are shifting it by one half. And this is x of 2t minus one. Again, you can check the different two different routes and uh, validate that they have the same results. I will skip the plots for the second round. And the next transformation is from x of t to x of t divided 2 plus 1. And similar to the last two problems, we have two different ways to, uh, to perform this transformation. Method 1 is to first stretch x of 2 twice. Stretching by twice, we have x of t divided by 2. And then we shift this signal to the left by two units. Again, we remember that when shift, we only change t, but we don't change anything else. That's why the denominator 2 is just copied down, and we change the numerator t to t plus 2, which is x of t divided 2 by 2 plus 1. The second method is to first shift x of t to the left by one unit. Then we get x of t plus 1. And then we stretch it twice. When stretching it, we are only changing t to t divided by 2. But plus 1 is copied down without any change. So we, we also get x of t plus 2, the t divided by 2 plus 1. And this should, be, this should have the same result, which is here. The, the last one, it requires three steps. So we, want, we start from x of t, we want to obtain x of one minus t divided by two. Again, since it's three steps, there are different routes, more, even more than two routes to lead to the final result. We can first do the shift, then do the stretch, then do the reflection, or we can first do the reflection, then shift, then stretch, and so on. And here, let me choose, arbitrarily choose one route. We first do the reflection, because this is what we are most familiar with. So we start from x of t, we change it to x of minus t, just a reflection over the vertical axis, or just a mirroring over the vertical axis. Then from x of minus t, we shift it to the right by one unit. Shifting to the right, we are changing t to t minus 1. But don't forget this round brackets around t minus 1, because the original negative sign in x of minus t should be copied down outside of the variable, which is x of 1 minus t. So shifting to the right, from starting from minus 2, shifting to the right, the new plot starts from minus 1 are doing the correct shift. Then the last step is to stretch it twice. By stretching it twice, everything else does not change. We still have x, 1, minus sign does not change. The only change is that the variable t is changed to t divided by 2. So the only change occurs to the variable t itself. Then we are stretching it twice, which means the original square has with 1, and now it has with two, so it starts from minus two. The triangle originally ranges from one to two, now it ranges from two to four because everything should be expanded twice of the original value. Uh, you can, there are actually different routes to get the same result, which I hope you can uh, do it as practice. Okay. This is exercise one. Uh, time domain transformation for continuous time C. So now let's look at example with discrete time signal. Because when we, when I first introduced those concepts of time scaling, time shift, or time reversal reflection, we are always using the continuous time signal to illustrate. Uh, these concepts apply in a quite similar way to discrete time signal, but it will be better if we can use example to illustrate those concepts. Uh, here I plot a discrete time signal which looks quite complicated, but uh, don't worry, let's 
look at this signal very carefully. So discrete time signal, the vertical horizontal axis is integer time n, integer time index n. And for this particular signal, I marked the values of the function x over n with those black dots. It means for all n less than or equal to minus one, x of n is zero. So the black dots are all on the uh, vertical, uh, on the horizontal axis itself, it means x of n equals zero. For n equals minus three, x of n equals minus one, n equals minus two, x of n equals minus two, n equals minus one, x of, two, uh, x of n equals minus three divided by two. And then for every integer time n, I marked the value of x of n here. For this signal, well, our task is to plot x of one minus two n. So again, it involves multiple steps of transformation. First, we change from x of n to x of minus n. This is similar to the continuous time case. It's a reflection, but this time it's in a discrete time. So what do I mean by discrete time reflection? First, by doing the reflection, the measure is the uh, vertical axis or the axis n equals zero itself. So on this mirror, the value of does not change. Originally it's one half, the new value is still one half. But everything to the right of the mirror is now flipped to the left. So if we start from zero and read it to the right, it is zero, one, 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 minus one, zero, zero, zero. Now the same thing happens if we read it to the left. So if we start from the mirror, straight to the left, zero, one, 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 minus one. Similarly, everything originally on the left of n equals zero is now flipped to the right, because if we originally read to the left, it is minus three divided by two, minus two, minus one, zero, zero, and so on. Now, if we read to the right, it's minus three divided by two, minus two, minus one, zero, zero, and so on. So this is the time reflection or time reversal for the discrete time C. The first step is the reflection. Second step is the shift. Again, we are changing n to n minus one. Don't forget this pair of round blackheads to include n minus one because the original negative sign in front of n should just be copied down as is x of minus n minus one equals x of one minus n. This is a shift of the discrete time signal to the right by one unit. And this shift should not be hard to understand because originally this, uh, this point n equals zero, we have x of n equals x of minus n equals one over two, then the new signal, this one minus two value should be shifted one unit to the right, in other words, to the point where n equals one. And then everything keeps the same shape, but shift to the right. This is shift. And then the compression. Well, compression is perhaps a little bit involved to understand because for discrete time signal, it involves the loss of some points during the compression. What I mean this for? Now we, are, we start from the signal x of one minus n, which is what we obtained on the last page, just paste it here. Then we change it to our target, x of my one minus two n. So by changing n to two n, we are compressing the signal to one half of the original one. But here, notice that we are looking at a discrete time signal. By definition, discrete time signals are only well defined for discrete time n, in other words, n being integers. But by compressing this signal to one half, if you look at this point, originally the signal has n equals minus one, x of one minus n equals one. But this point after compression, it should be moved to 
minus one half because minus one divided by two is minus one minus one half. But minus one half is not an integer. In other words, after compression, this point will be moved to a time n that is not an integer. And then it's not well defined for a discrete time signal. Yes, in that case, the student asked, in that case, this information will just be lost, will just be removed. Similarly, for all the time n being all the numbers, which means n equals minus one, minus three, minus five, n equals positive one, positive three, positive five, positive seven. After the compression, they will all be moved to the points that are not integer values. And therefore, for the new signal to be a valid discrete time signal, these points must be removed. They must be lost. So all these points in the red, in the red circles are lost. What we only retain are the signals that are originally not in the red, red, red circles. For example, originally we have this point, n equals minus two, it takes value one. After compression, this value one appears at n equals minus one. Originally, we have this point n equals minus four takes value minus one. After the compression, the point minus one appears at a new time minus two because minus four divided by two is minus two. And similarly, for the points two and four is minus three divided by two minus one. These two points are retained, but they appear at the compressed time one and two. Okay. So there's a compression. Uh, one might thought that what happens if we are stretching that signal? So if we have a discrete time signal x of n, we stretch it to x of n divided by two. Well, in that case, the, uh, the new signal, we have, instead of losing some original point, we have to be careful about the, okay, so, so for this part, I will just skip it this moment because uh, there is no slide, but I will leave it as a uh, supplement material, which the TAs might, uh, might uh, explain in the, in the tutorial. Okay, so we have uh, done two exercises related to the uh, time domain transformations of both continuous time and discrete time signals. And uh, by applying the time reversal or time reflection operation, we also introduce a property of a signal, whether a signal is odd signal or even signal. And another important property of a signal, which is perhaps more important, is the periodicity. So whether a signal is periodic or not. So to introduce this concept, let's first look at those signals on the uh, right-hand side of the oh, I always forgot to change it to full screen mode. On the right-hand side of the slide. So there are are uh, some common features of these signals, whether they are continuous time signals or whether it is a discrete time signal. The feature is that it repeats some pattern. So intuitively, it repeats some bad pattern by itself. Or if we state this pattern, in other words, if we shift this signal by a certain amount, it will overlap with this itself. So this kind of signal, we call it a periodic signal. And uh, to state this property more formally, here is a definition of periodic signal. So a continuous time signal x of t is a periodic signal if x of t equals x of t plus capital T for some positive number t and for all t in, in real, in, as real numbers. So how to understand this definition? X of T plus capital T from the definition of time shift, we can understand as the shift signal to the left by T units. 
actually it doesn't matter here whether we are shifting it to the left or to the right because they are equivalent. So here let's just say we are shifting to the left. If a signal after shifting to the left by capital T unit, it is the same with the original signal, then this is a periodic signal. So this definition applies to all the examples here because if we shift it to the left by certain amount, denoted by capital T, then it overlaps with itself. And the same definition applies to discrete time signal. It's a periodic signal, X of N, if, uh, here I made a typo, uh, this, uh, N, around this N plus N, it should be square brackets instead of round brackets. So if X of N equals X of N plus N, in other words, if we shift the signal by n units to the left, then it overlaps with itself, the signal is periodic. Here, we shift the signal three units to the left, it overlaps with itself, so n equals capital three is a period of this signal. So for discrete time signals, the period n must be integers. If n is not, we cannot find the integer n that satisfies this definition, then it's not periodic. And a further property associated with the periodic signal is that if a signal, see, let, let's take the continuous signal X of T as an example. X of T as an example. If it is periodic with period T, then two times T, three times T, any positive integer times t are also the periods of x of t. The reason is just from the definition. Because t is a period of x of t, so x of t plus t equals x of t. Then x of t plus 2t, if you separate 2t as t plus t, we can remove 1t and the signal is still itself. So x of t plus 2t equals x of t plus t equals x t. Then by definition, x of t equals x of t plus 2t, then 2t is also a period of this signal. For the same reason, 3t is also a period of the signal. 4t, every positive integer times t is a period of this signal. Then for the continuous time signal, there must be a smallest positive number t that satisfies the definition of periodicity of signal. And this smallest positive number t is called the fundamental period of x of t. And for those continuous time signals on the right hand side, the fundamental period is always t equals two. So t equals two means we shift every signal by two units overlaps with itself. Actually, t equals four t equals 6, 8, 10, every t being odd number is also a period of that signal. But those are not the fundamental period. The fundamental period is unique. It is the smallest one, t equals 2. The same thing happens to the uh, discrete time signal. For the discrete time signal on the right, we know that we move it, we shift it by 3, it overlaps with itself. Then if we shift it with, uh, for six units, it also overlaps with itself. In other words, not only three, but also six, nine, 12, 15, all the multiplic multiplicities of three are the period of this discrete time signal. But the fundamental period is unique. It is the smallest integer that's possible, that, that's, that's ever possible to be the period n equals three is a fundamental period. Okay. So to summarize today's lecture, I first introduce the definition of a signal, which is a function of independent variables. Uh, in this class, independent variables refer to time and the frequency. And for the first, for the first part of those class, we always focus on time being the independent variable, as you saw from all the examples. 
and the signal should convey some information. And therefore it is important and everywhere in our life. That's why we learned this class because of its importance. Uh, we introduced definitions of continuous time and discrete time signals. Both are important. We used the continuous time signal to illustrate some basic transformation of signals in the time domain, including time shift, time scaling, time reversal and reflection. Uh, from the time reversal reflection, we introduced the concept of uh, even or, or signal. Even signal is a signal that's symmetric along the vertical axis or a signal that does not change if we reflect it. Or, or the signal is a signal that's anti-symmetric or a signal that if we reflect it over time, it's also flipped upside down. Then we look at a two exercises, one with the time domain transformation. What we learn is that we can have, we can perform multiple steps of time transformation to a destination signal. And the steps, the route along those steps are not unique. And we can use different route to validate our result. And the same operations not only apply to continuous time signal, but also applies to uh, discrete time signals. And we use example to illustrate that. And finally, we introduce the concept of periodic signals for both continuous time and discrete time. Uh, periodic signal, basically a signal that repeats its own pattern or a signal that is identical after shifting by a certain amount. Uh, and we introduce the concept of fundamental period with the smallest positive number that is ever possible to be a period. Or the, in other words, the smallest uh, number that by shift, shifting by which we can obtain the same signal. Ah, I see this uh, question on the uh, chat window. Why the T and N should be positive, negative four? Yeah. Well, mathematically, so let me first clarify that mathematically, a periodic signal is also valid for positive, uh, for negative T. For example, for this signal, for those signals on the right, we say that X of T equals X of T plus two, and T is a period. But it all, if we say X of T equals X of T minus two, it is also correct. So if we have some negative number capital T, in this case, capital T equals minus two, it is still a valid statement. But for our convenience, we always define the, uh, define the period to be positive number. In other words, we restrict ourselves to positive T and N because it's just a convention. We always want to have a positive period. So it's just a convention. Okay, so that's all I want to uh, share with you for this lecture. Uh, I'm happy that we, are five, we have a five minute early release. I hope that you enjoy this class and we will enjoy the entire term. Uh, let's meet again on the Friday lecture, 9.30. Uh, the Friday lecture use a different Zoom link. Uh, please look at the Zoom link on Blackboard and don't, don't go to the wrong, wrong meeting. Thanks.